This podcast is part of the Game and Entertainment Network. Visit tgenetwork.net to find the latest episodes from all our shows. It's time for AgriChat, the official podcast of the Tales of the Agronaut blog and stalwart gaming community, where we talk about stuff and things and the stuff about the things, and sometimes gaming. I'm Belgast, and let's start the show. Hey folks, it's that time again. Time for another episode of AgriChat. This is episode 200. 200. Tonight I'm joined by Ashgar. Yeah, this is going to be a while. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. Hi. <laughs> Grace. Hello. Tam. Hello. And Phelan. Hey there. <laughs> I didn't say COVID, wow. did I? Wow. <laughs> Happy you 200th episode. Derailed me completely. <laughs> So Kodra, yes, Kodra's here too. I was like, I got to the end of the list, and I'm like, did I forget something? Hi. Yes. Yes, you did. Good job. <laughs> 200 episodes in, and we are still real professionals. Oh, yeah. I'm not good at yeah. this at all. So yeah, we made it 200 shows, so that's kind of cool. Yay. That's a big number. That's like, what, almost four it years? Is. It's more than four years. More than four it's, years. It's more than four years, yeah. We're in our fifth year now our, so given uh, given that our older episodes tended to be longer i wonder how close we are to like a thousand hours of content i don't know i need to add it up because yeah no it's probably there like i would not be shocked um because there for a while we were averaging over two hours an episode that's uh um, that's a lot <laughs> yeah so so we've done a thing we've done a thing regularly and we've recorded lots of them so yeah and and we've made some changes recently to help ensure the future of the show. Yes, yes. So that I could actually maybe miss one every now and then. Yo. Um, I want to just take a quick moment to like thank our listeners because we have a a shockingly large number of people that listen to every single show, and I don't know why you do it, but yeah, seriously, thank you. Why? Thanks. <laughs> yeah, we appreciate like, it. I, I, I feel like you're making it. some poor lifestyle choices, but <laughs> whatever. But we're yeah. grateful. Yeah, I'm thankful. Oh, man. I saw a great tweet this week where, hey, we should start a podcast together is the new, hey, we should start a band together. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And I feel like that's about right. Yeah, except for this, the tweet I version that I saw specifically said it was a millennial thing, and I'm very much not a millennial, so. <laughs> you're you're, you're honorary. Yeah, you're really in spirit, though. I feel like I like I don't necessarily fit into to my generation anymore. Um, like there there was a time that I thought I was like pure Gen X, but no, nah, I'm just kind of. I feel like I'm a boundary hopper. I care way too much about Twitter to be a pure Gen Xer. Anyway, so we're gonna do a show, and we have some topics to talk about. And there's a thing that happened this week that was really freaking cool that none of us were expecting. Monster Hunter World patched in like a brand new zone and a really big, epic raid-like boss encounter. Yeah, it's a yeah. giant golden dragon. So surprised yet again we're talking about Monster Hunter. Yeah, no, this is well to some extent like this is their fault for constantly giving us content to talk about. I mean, it's it's very similar to how we used to talk about you know Final Fantasy or World of Warcraft or whatever MMO we were playing at the current time. This is just our current MMO. Yeah. Which like I feel like I feel like the big thing with this with with this latest release is them proving they can do event bosses. Like they aren't awful. Yeah. Because they've done there are event bosses in Monster Hunter and they're bad. Like bad. Pickle was annoying. Mm. No. Pickle's not really an event boss. More no, like I mean Zora. Yeah, like Zora. Yeah, Zora's just Zora is an improved version of Dahir and Moran, but um, better is not exactly good in this case. Yeah. I feel like we keep saying that specific phrase about Monster Hunter. And this is this is a point, this is this for me marks a turning point where Monster Hunter stopped doing better but not quite good and jumped from Actually, this is quite good. <laughs> this is, it's not only quite yeah. good, but there's a whole bunch of other games and other genres that should be looking at this and learning. It's really innovative too. Like that's that's the biggest thing that take away from this event is that they managed to do a thing and they did it in a in a very innovative way that 
they've not done before in this game to where you basically have a boss that your entire session is working on but each individual team of four players gets their own version and can kind of see the progress of what the other teams are doing at the same time yeah basically and that's everybody, interesting gets, to me. everybody gets to contribute by going in and, fight, and fighting the boss and you have a pursuit rating that you want to increase and the higher it is the easier of a time you have with the boss the more likely you are to actually take it out and everybody what everybody does contributes to that pursuit rating and the rewards are based on how many of the boss's parts you break and everything and what everybody does contributes to that and then yeah. your own personal one is based on what you specifically you know were involved in and it works really well and it's a fun boss yeah it's really really neat and it's got there's a bunch of different objectives that you accomplish in monster hunter style different ways which are like breaking different parts different specific parts of this boss and like the best rewards you can get are from breaking every part of the boss and then defeating it and that's a really really cool it's a really cool system especially because a lot of that progress is shared across teams and i want to see this design in other games well, and as a callback to something we've talked about in, 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 in uh, I think it was last week's show, where boss scaling, um, this works surprisingly well with a bunch of groups of randoms and a group that you built yourself and any number of teams within it. Like, the only thing that you're really sacrificing is the speed of the encounter by reducing the number of teams working mm -hmm. on it. Like, it's still completely doable just to take four of your friends, which are honestly, like, we had more people on last night than we normally do, but usually we can field, like, a team of four players. Um, yeah. And it worked. Like, it was enough people to keep moving it forward. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, the, the second time that I ran it, we did it with a team of three, and we successfully completed it. Fittedly, one of those three was Shiana, so, you know, counts for two. <laughs> Shiana's overpowered. <laughs> But I, I, I think, just based on my own experimentation with it, I, I am fairly certain that this event is soloable if you are good enough. If you're good I would imagine. Solo. I would imagine, yes. If you're what? Some really good people have managed to solo it in one run. That's impressive. But that's, that's, that's ridiculously madness. impressive. <laughs> yeah. That's so. madness. So it's possible to like solo kill that boss in a single run with four people? With one person. Well, yeah, but like interesting there, I thought there's you... no multiplayer scaling on this one so yeah it's definitely possible oh. for people as well oh yeah. there's no multiplayer scaling on it that's no. interesting but yeah the, it's the pursuit rating always multiplayer scaled the pursuit rating just makes it easier to break all the parts but i mean if you can do enough damage you can break all the parts your first time in well and if you're taking advantage of exploiting each of the weaknesses on each of the phases i think it would probably go way faster or, yeah, a lot of rocks. I was going to say, more Got likely, you're probably doing something very degenerate. Not necessarily. Not necessarily? Interesting. It's more like there rocks are a lot of things. environmental things you can use against it. Yeah, that's, that's the other thing that I really like about it, is it's really heavily focused on emphasizing missable potential. Like, missable mechanics. There's a ton of environmental stuff that you can do to push the boss forward it's about breaking parts which you probably have figured out by that point but you don't necessarily have to have yeah the, the boss's hit points the actual boss doesn't you can't you can't kill it you know when you finally break its horns it runs away and the goal is to break its horns so you, your your focus needs to be on breaking parts not on killing the boss and yeah, you can drop rocks on it, you can fire cannons at it, there's opportunities to mount it, it's, you know, all sorts of stuff. It seems to have a really, really low mount threshold in the final phase. Like, incredibly low. Yeah, I, th I think that's the intended way to get it to, you know, stand still and drop its head long enough to actually damage the horns. So, I kind of mentioned this, but it's one of those things where I really like this idea of collectively fighting like working on doing something and what it kind of reminded me of was old big world quests where you were sort of working with every other player to like solve this insurmountable goal and i always have enjoyed the concept of that 
But the one that I took part in was on Garage, and it was miserable because <laughs> everything that game was asking you to do was miserable. Go farm cloth. Go farm, Go farm cloth. fish. Go farm Go, bugs. Yeah. Yeah, like, what, if, what if instead of making you farm a whole bunch of crap to do a thing as a server, they made you kill a giant boss? Yeah. <laughs> so the, the only difference here is that even if you weren't at the level cap, you could farm cloth and contribute. But this is I have not beat the game yet in Monster Hunter, and so I can't touch this event, and it makes me sad. Yeah, they did. They did make it require you to have completed the the story. Insert yeah. linear levels are bad rant here. Yes. I mean, this well, isn't even a linear levels issue. This is really just a straight up like the game wants you to finish the story part. Before you yeah. Can. Yeah. And there's no real good reason for it for for this fight. But on the plus side, I mean, it's given me some motivation to try to finish off the story before this event goes away because it sounds super fun. It is super fun. Yeah. I am also glad that they are, they seem to be rotating events back in at a somewhat reasonable pace. So while this is limited time, it should be back before too long. Yeah. I get the impression that they, from, from the kind of structure that they're, that they're working towards, I get the impression that they want to get to a point where they have something like this going on all the time. That would make sense. But I do like, I like their, I like some of their creative events. I mean, I I know it's not everybody's favorite thing, but I like, hey, fight these three stupid monsters all at once. <laughs> You'll have to deal with all of the things that they're going to do with each other to each other. Depends and on the monsters. Yeah. I would rather do them in the arena than in an open map, which is probably weird because it it does mean you're literally going to fight all three things at once, but you're also not dealing with like basil guys and <laughs> pickle and <laughs> yeah. triple threat throwdown was perfectly reasonable. It was just three lizards in the special arena. For the most part, the O Dog quest is O Dog Mega Man quest is pretty reasonable, except for the fact that the small one is harder to hit and somehow still harder to dodge and hits just as hard as the big O Dog. Yeah. Well the biggest problem there is like it's impossible to fight that without tripping everybody up. When free is your friend. That's, yeah, that thing's a little annoying. Coming up on the Dante quest, which has the objective, kill all monsters, or hunt all monsters. And it's, it looks like it's going to be in the main arena, and the only monster visible in the screenshot is Teostra. So I'm slightly concerned <laughs> for what that quest is going to contain. Yeah. Ugh. I would not be surprised if it's Teostra and Valhazak, at least. I think Valhazak is, along with Nergigante, one of the few monsters that's only ever on one map. Yeah, since Currently. his abilities are so directly related to the stuff in the Rotten Vale, the Miasma. Yeah, I feel like Valhazak would be so much easier if he weren't in a Miasma map. Yeah, he kind of, kind of brings I mean, it yes. <laughs> I really dig the random weapon thing, which isn't really random, but sort of random. In part because this event is giving me a bunch of weapon options for things that I've not actually played with. Yeah, that's my favorite part of it is now I have, I think at this point, I have at least a rank six of every single weapon type that I can experiment with. Yeah, I broke out a hunting horn last night. It was really fun. I never even played. I It it was actually to the point where we're like hopping into the double Diablos fight and I pull out the hunting horn and I get the like, what's his name? The tutorial guy telling me about hunting mm -hmm. horns. Yeah, that was the first time I was doing like the uh, O Dogs fight the other day was when I the first time I'd ever used Switch Axe. Did you do it just for the music? No, I just like I'm I'm gonna do this another time. I'm gonna try something I've not tried before. I made myself a Xeno Switch Axe. I might as well use it. But the biggest problem with like other weapons that you're not used to is like I wasn't even sure what the hell to build for these weapons. It wasn't necessarily that I didn't want to spend crafting materials on it. I just didn't know what I should actually go for. Mm -hmm. And now this is going to give me a sampling of weapons to play with so that I can maybe figure out what I actually like in each one of those things. Because I've learned over the years that like my taste in weapons aren't necessarily like the tastes of the people building guides. <laughs> I'm using the CNC longsword and nobody can tell me to stop. <laughs> It's a great event, though, and like I kind of, I kind of love the way that they just sprung it on us because there was no. I was a surprise. Of this, it yeah, was announced like, on Tuesday. 
Yeah. I'm like, hey, hey, it's going in in less than 48 hours. Yeah. But, like, a lot of times there's just leaks, at least, that we know something's going to happen. Like, we don't necessarily know the specifics of the Devil May Cry event yet. But we knew for a really long time it was coming yeah. before they officially announced it. This one, nobody had any clue on. So I find it really interesting that they were able to keep that amount of secrecy and then just like roll this thing out. And it wasn't a small change at all. Like this is a big map. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 they're not reusing a map. large map for yeah. just this map is only for fighting this one giant gold monster. Sort of like Zeno's map is just for fighting Zeno. Yeah. And it's, like, I mean, this is way bigger than Zeno's map. Yeah, and it's got like new endemic life that we haven't seen in other places. So there's you it's know all sorts of harvest nodes and yeah, little gold critters to catch and make your pets. I have a gold bat hanging in in the doorway of my room. <laughs> I still haven't caught one of the snakes. I don't think I've even seen one yet. No, I've got the beetles and the bats, and I think that's it so far. There's gold-coated Gajalaka that are awful, and I hate them. They are the worst. They are less bad than normal Gajalaka, at least. I mean, it's true. They don't have the status effect of uh, throwing darts. So it took me a really long time to to catch on to this notion that I should be killing Gajalaka just simply to build spirit meter. <laughs> that makes sense. I just killed Gajalaka on general principles. Yeah, <laughs> I killed them because otherwise they'll try to knock me over when I'm doing something you know important well my theory is that my base attacks don't really do that much damage in the we're all doing white damage phases and i can i can run around and kill gajalaka and get all the way to a red sword and then undump or dump my uh, spirit helm breaker on colv and actually do reasonable damage and with a decent chance of breaking something yeah, I tried Kulth with a hammer, and I found that that creature is up, is move. Big creatures can move surprisingly quickly. I really want to try that fight with uh, Switch Axe. Tried it with Lance and Heavy Bowgun now. And the thing that those weapons have in common is that they have shields. So I'm considering trying it with dual blades, but I'm probably going to do very poorly my first time. I found dual blades to be pretty effective. I think Sword and Shield would be pretty good since you can technically mount the monster in most of those phases and Sword and Shield is good at mounting things. <laughs> I just do not think I want to ever take in my fire Sword and Shield. Yeah, that might not do a whole lot. Wasn't somebody suggesting fire as the element to bring to that? Like, it was, I think I think it was a theory in whether or not you could use fire attacks to heat up the plate that so maybe that you it would could actually do faster. Right, you yeah. could do orange damage, but I don't know if that's true or not. I've seen that mentioned, but I've not actually seen a confirmation of that. I mean, it would make sense, but what kind of weapon was the person who sold it using? Something I'm ranged, sure. probably. Probably something ranged. It is really ranged friendly as compared to melee friendly. Probably until the last phase. And even then, I don't think it's terribly melee-friendly. Cold I mean, has a giant tail yeah. that can, <laughs> can knock half of the room away from it. And I never can seem to time that. I kept hoping I'd get a light bow gun, but I keep getting heavy bow guns. I somehow doubt that I'm really going to like being stuck in place as a heavy bow gun. I prefer heavy bow gun at this point. I mean, using really? using heavy bow gun in Gatling gun mode is is pretty fun. I don't know. I guess I need to kill the punching bag a few times so I can get used to it. And you can put a shield on it, which can be helpful. Highly recommended. Running with either a shield or a bait extender. The heavy bow gun roll is unique and slow, but very long, and you can make it even longer. Mm. This guy also seems to drop a lot of chunks. Which makes yeah. the whole picking up items in the middle of a fight more of a thing with him. He seems to expose a lot of the uh, less used features of Monster Hunter. I really hey, like do it. Do you know what? Do you know what wedge beetles are? Yeah. You should know what wedge beetles are. I'm slowly getting better yeah. at using wedge beetles. Same. I was not very good at it. I, I had happily been practicing using them already. So yeah, using them to get around the map. It's a lot of fun. And Spider-Man around, it's surprisingly satisfying. You can get up to Legiana's Nest in Coral Highlands without the Glider Mantle fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. Not as quickly as you can with the Glider Mantle, but you know, nobody's perfect. 
Also, cannons are really good in the early phases. As long as she doesn't, you know, just suddenly decide to go off on a dead run. That seems to happen at high pursuit levels, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, as the pursuit goes up, she seems to move really fast. Turns out I was incorrect. This person did a few runs early to get the pursuit level up and then managed to solo it. Okay. Ah, uh, okay. At four and then again at six. Using dual blades. That's kind of impressive. I mean, that one dual blade move that basically runs the entire length of the monster doing damage seems like it would be really, really good against against her. I feel like it'd be less good because there's not a whole lot to break up there. Well, it would be good good on the tail parts and the horns. But yeah, yeah, because I, I bet you're getting wasted. I bet you're getting double damage on both sides of the tail when you do that. That's probably true. I'm not entirely sure how Shiana was keeping track of which parts he needed to break to get credit for it. They're tracked in the gathering hub. You can see what you've broken and what you have partial credit for. Mm, okay. So can you knock the gold off the horns more than once? Technically, yes. Between multiple sessions? Oh, yeah. yes, absolutely. I mean, not sessions, but but runs of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel like that would be a really good way to try and get gems. I don't know how much more intelligible I have to speak about this event. Basically, it was really good. If you have beaten the game, I highly suggest checking it out. If you're close to beating the game, I highly suggest powering through the tail end of the game because it goes away May 3rd, I think. Sounds right. It's supposed to be two weeks total. And then it will be back around at some point in the future. I had every game. intent of farming it all day long, but then I, I was playing the game of the month, so you know that's probably something I should be doing anyway. So another thing that came up this week is I got into Magic the Gathering Arena, and so did Kodra. Yay! <laughs> I'm putting quotes around Kodra. Fodra. Uh, Fodra. It's an account. I, I, I've played a lot of it, but I have a feeling, Kodra, you may have played more at this point. I mean, I got my 15 wins and then some. Okay, yeah, I've got my 10 wins, and I'm about two wins away from 15. So, you have played way more than I have. But... I have probably conceded a bunch of games, because, like, if by round three stuff is not going well, I just concede. Yeah, but then you you lose out on, uh, you lose progression on your rank I don't I don't care about my rank. But but I want to be rank one. I want to be the very best. <laughs> like no one ever was? <laughs> like no one ever was. Uh, so, yeah, they've got uh, two sets. They've got four sets in. The Ixalod block and the Amonkhet block. And, and Dominaria is coming next week. Oh, is it? Yes, it is. On the 26th. Oh, no. Oh, now I need to make a new deck. <laughs> I don't I don't think they're taking any of the other ones out yet, but no, Dominaria is going in on the 26th. They still need to make Kaladesh, honestly. Yeah, like Kaladesh to, is definitely needed right now. Like to, there's a couple cards us, that are I mean, or, or or alternatively, Kaladesh is really not needed right now because it's a bit of a broken set. There's some really good cards that might look like without Kaladesh. Yeah. So what would standard look like without Kaladesh? Well, let me tell you what my assessment was. Vampires, 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 vampires. And merfolk. I mean, merfolk are fine, but it actually... So m when I was getting into this game, I was like, you can't buy packs right now. You can't really, like, generate... Merfolk requires a lot of rares, a high density yeah. of rares. Uh, Vampires requires very few rares, actually. I I came up against a really well tuned Merfolk deck, and it was brutal. Oh, I'm sure. Like if it if it has all of the right cards, it would be awful. But like the core, most of the core cards in Vampires are commons and uncommons. Yeah, if I'm really looking at the the cards that are important rares in. Uh, the vampire deck, it's really just uh, Champion of Dusk and, uh, what's it, Radiant Destiny. Everything else is a common or uncommon. Oh, Legion's Landing. I forgot Legion's Landing. Which you don't want to, you probably want three of those. Legendary and all makes it a little awkward. So for anyone who is completely unaware of what Magic Arena is, 
Um, Magic the Gathering Online, we've talked a bit in the past, and it is not a really it, good game. It's not a good UI. It's very no. bad. It's, it is a UI as designed by somebody who thought Windows 98 was the height well, of design <laughs> aesthetic. Okay, so, so to be fair... It was a UI that was designed to compete with, like, Apprentice and the non-official clients for playing Magic the Gathering online that were also not really good UIs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, it was so better than those. It was better than those, and it, and it did what it needed to do at the time, but that time has passed, and a little game called Hearthstone... Hearthstone came out and made a really clean fast-paced easy to use uh, collectible card game type interface and from that point on everyone else has kind of created a hearthstone x interface for their card game at this point i'm going to whine and complain that magic duels existed what eight years ago with a magic duels interface ex- magic duels existed mm-hmm. but never got any real love it's true Wizards has traditionally been afraid of the internet. Yeah. It's true. And it, I'd be lying if I said they aren't still afraid of the internet. So the thing is, is like, if you go into Arena expecting Duels of the Planeswalkers or Magic Duels with a robust AI mode that you can play against, or things like puzzle mode, you are going to be sorely disappointed. Like, this is this is a versus client. It is a really good versus client. Um, it does a lot of calculation and figuring out what you can you can play as far as moves go and just auto-skipping you ahead if you have nothing to do, which speeds up the game immensely. But then I can't bluff. No, but, it's fine. But <laughs> like, if you really want to, you can slow it down and play in, I don't know what they call it, it's some kind of advanced mode where you like have to okay every single move actually pass priority every time yes pass priority every single time yeah there's there's a way to flip it into and you can do it on the fly you can it's a hotkey combination i forget what it is but you can flip it like so if you know you're going to have a very technical move next round you can flip it into that mode and play a single round that way and then flip it right back into auto mode make things go miserably slow you say interesting yeah there are already assholes that will spam the Hearthstone-esque emotes to taunt you while they play. Like, that's already a thing in Arena. I haven't run into that. Like, Interesting. Like, there was a there was one guy, it was the Murlocs, or, or not the Murlocs, the uh, Merfolk players. <laughs> um, Murlocs. Like, every time I made a move, he would spam, oops, oops, oops. I mean, I, so, Mag- yeah. That does sound quite annoying. Yeah, it was it was annoying. But, I mean, that's something that happens in Hearthstone as well, so it's not shocking. Um, it's a good client. Like, it's a really good client. It, it lets you play actual magic instead of Hearthstone. I'm a fan. I'm really interested in seeing what this becomes over time. Um, I know they have planned a mobile client. And they have planned draft mode, which is supposedly coming really soon. Um, it's, I, I love the whole, you get a random card after you win thing. Draft mode might be my undoing. I feel like they gave us enough packs to start off with. They did. Like, I felt like I was able to get again, and maybe, maybe this is just me. I was able to get to my skew, my, my very good list very quickly. Um, and, and I'm having a lot of fun playing it. Yeah. So there's like a, a daily... I don't know if it's daily or weekly thing to get a pack or two. Um, you know, you get quests kind of like in other games like this where you do a thing and you get some gold and then you can spend the gold on a pack. Um, every time you win, you get a random card. And you said, I think you mentioned before that uh, that you can essentially trade in duplicates, unnecessary duplicates for specific cards like crafting yes. and Hearthstone. Yes, yeah, so so when you're opening packs, packs are way smaller than normal magic packs. You get one rare, two uncommons, and five commons. Really? And so really what that means is you get seven less commons. Yeah, seven less commons. Mostly okay. I I feel like otherwise 
you would get flooded with comments. So automatically, if you're opening a pack and you already have a play set of a card, you get a token that is of a specific rarity. So it's either a common or an uncommon or a rare or a mythic. Um, and then you can take that common and trade it one for one for the card that you need. So it feels less bad and it feels less lossy. Like to me, the Hearthstone crafting feels like you're trading a lot of play value for not enough to make the same rarity of another card that you want. Yeah, the, I mean, this system sounds a lot more generous. If you could it's, just straight up trade a rare for a different rare, that that sounds good. It's pretty generous, and I think the the only difference is you can't just trade a rare for another rare. Correct. You can only trade a rare if you already have a playset of that rare. So it's or, not like sure, but that's still much. I think that's still a much better deal than what you get in Hearthstone. Right. And sometimes wild cards are just a thing you open. You don't have yeah. to have a playset, which I opened a bunch of wild cards and used those to like pack my deck essentially. Yeah, the only reason why I pointed that out is because like there are players that like say I'm going to play a warlock, so I'm going to burn every card I get for any class other than warlock and Hearthstone, so that I can build the ultimate warlock deck. And that's not a thing you can do. That like you just can't willfully convert things into tokens. You either get a token or or a wild card or um you get a card in its place you don't you can't just burn things for the sake of getting new things i am curious what's going to happen when i unlock this vault i don't know exactly supposedly it's a lot of more a lot more cards i don't know if that's more packs or if it's just more cards it the, it also so it also has a quest system which i enjoy uh as a way to get gold i feel like one of the things that this game could do to generate a lot of money is basically expose the draft game for less than a standard draft price, which I think is going to happen. Because honestly, like, I've, I've beat this horse to death, but Magic Draft is some of the... This is one of the best games. Like... I don't feel like Arena does as good of a job at being Magic Draft as it's trying to be. I don't feel like any of its other competitors have as good of a draft game. All of these sets are very meticulously designed to support draft. And I think ultimately it's going to be... It'll be interesting to see what their draft mode looks like. In order for that to be reasonable, wouldn't they have to re-add the commons to the packs? Yes, and they already have said they are. Like, draft wow. packs are standard packs. It'll be interesting to find out if you can realistically keep the upkeep of being able to do drafts just by doing your daily quests. Uh, see, I don't even necessarily think that. Like, I was paying $14 to draft at Magic Online because I really like playing draft. If you're going to tell me I can pay 6 bucks to draft in uh, a much better client, I'm not going to care that I can't convert the cards to real cards i'm going to be doing that a lot i feel like there's some opportunity if if the cost per pack what is the cost per pack in hearthstone actually I'm curious um around two dollars a pack hearthstone pack is five cards right yeah hearthstone deck is 30 cards yeah i believe so and you can only have two of any given card right yeah but like on uh, realistically um, i mean and again asterisk 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 a magic deck is like 35 to 45 cards right right because, because land basically is a thing. although i mean again most decks are gonna like most serious decks are gonna be looking at getting some serious lands in there there are a lot of really good land cycles at this point so i think everybody's gonna at least play with some of those i'm really interested to see how Dominaria draft shakes out. Pre-release I've... was yesterday, today? Pre-release pre -release started midnight yesterday into today, and I did attend, and it's very, very legendary focused. <laughs> you get a legendary, at least one in every pack. You get a legendary and at least one legendary in every pack. Um, but, like, 
that means that you might have four to five legendaries. And so cards that are legendary dependent are very frequent. And I kept like thinking about them and I was like, oh man, like I opened the Weatherlight, which is a really fun card and I got to play with it. But ultimately what it's doing is allowing you to search for historic spells and legendaries, artifacts, and sagas is not something that's going to come frequently to a sealed pool. So I'm kind of more curious from for Dominaria from the constructed perspective. Now that said, I feel wait, like... Wait, wait, wait. Is the Weatherlight itself legendary? The Weatherlight itself is legendary. So if I run Captain Sisse as my commander, she can actually go fetch the Weatherlight out of my deck? Uh, what does Captain Sisse say? A legend or legendary card. Uh, yes, she can. It is a legendary artifact vehicle. What's her power toughness? Because she might it's be able two, to... It's 2-2. Oh, she can't quite crew it. Well, no, you need more of the crew. Clearly. Clearly. Um... I feel this is like, going to be a really good set for Commander. I am curious about it being a set for Commander and a set for Brawl. <laughs> I feel like it's very much designed to be a set for Brawl. But I haven't found compelling Brawl decks yet. Like, I'm sure I could brew something up. But like every time I start to be like, ooh, this would be fun. I'm like, oh wait, Standard's card pool is just not that deep, is it? It's kind of small. Yeah, like it's not every card ever printed like Commander is. Yeah, there's. Uh, I I honestly am really tempted to play like a Kawinde Knight deck. Kawinde is uh two two double strike for four. Anyone who has first strike has double strike. What? Yup, legendary knight, and you could just put jam a whole bunch of creatures with first strike and make them bonkers. I'm super interested to see Dominaria come into Arena so that we can play with a bunch of these things rapidly. Yeah. I am probably going to start working on a mono-white monument deck then. Because Benelish Marshall exists, and that's also just a great card. I wonder if I could make mono-white humans work. I actually ordered a box of uh, Dominaria. Just Ooh. because, like, it looked cool. <laughs> Are you getting the Minotaur then? No, God, no. I'm not going to pay the price that it would cost to get that box from a local game oh, store. Oh, okay. Like, my, our local game stores do not sell for anywhere close to what is reasonable. Um, it's about, like, 120 to get a box of new stuff from them. And that Minotaur is not worth, what, 35 40 bucks. Definitely not. Based oh. on, like, I think I got my box of Dominaria for roughly 80 bucks. I do like that they give you basically 10 reason, like arguably reasonable ish decks to pick from in this game. In Arena, yeah. Like, there are a bunch of, like, so that was one of the complaints that I heard from, from another blogger was that he couldn't just pick up a deck and start playing. Like, he felt outgunned. And I picked up several of the decks just straight from what was available and started winning matches. Like, it's not like I was completely outclassed with the starter decks. I mean, I just picked up, like, I had a quest to win a win with uh, blue-red, and so I just picked up the Is It Spellweaving deck and made a couple of edits, and it was fine. I'm still largely playing the Golgari uh, Exploration deck by itself, I know there, as is. I know there are a lot of people who really like this one. There's also a cat deck. A cat tribal deck in here. That's pretty fun. Using the cat lord from Mom and Cat. It's got the cat lord from. It's got the two cat lords from Mom and Cat. I've had the embalm thing used against me, and it is just brutal. Where you end up with like an army of mummies. Yup. Recursively because of a couple of enchantments. Anointed procession. Yup. I love Anointed. That guy. Anointed Procession, one of the, like, four cards that I want to get for my to my dumb tokens deck. It's, it's like doubling season, right? Right? Yes, basically. It's not like season. I mean, it's exactly like doubling season. It's one-third of doubling season. <laughs> <laughs> it's really exactly like Primal Digger. Yeah. White. Yeah, that's fair. Doubling season was a mistake. Look, Anointed Procession is still plenty powerful. Doubling Season was a mistake. 
Anointed Procession is a totally fine card, uh, especially with something like Aketra's Monument, which I feel like should be... An, like, I, honestly, I kind of want to make a Monument deck because I I think those are going to come back into style and uh, standard, which Oketra's Monument is whenever you play a creature, also create a 1-1 white soldier. Also, all of your white creatures cost one colorless less to play. So you can see how you... Basically, mono white, uh, mono white uh, weenie was pretty good for a while. I feel like we're missing some of the best removal that's currently in standard because we don't have fatal push. Which I yeah, that's what I was gonna say. With. That's what I was gonna say. Is like black is a lot weaker with the absence of fatal push. Yeah, fatal push is like the only card I'm missing from the vampires deck. It's a good card though. Does Dominaria have a suitable replacement? Uh. Depends. How likely do you think we are to be running into legendary creatures? Because there's reasonably a, high. Because there's a colorless black destroy non legendary creature at Rumble. instant speed. I want to say the big problem that I've run into is in black at least. Like fatal push was the cheapest removal you had. Like everything else that I have access to is way more expensive. Yeah, like, the the next closest is probably Walk the Plane, which is Black Black Sorcery Destroy Target non merfolk Creature. Right, which is awesome until you get up against a merfolk deck. And then it's very sad. Uh, that's another thing I'm actually curious about. Uh, if they're going to uh, ever, like, introduce tournaments that would allow you to play, like, standard matches where you would have sideboarding. Because, well, I feel like if you can get away totally fine without sideboarding in, like, limited drafts, like, your sideboard is really not coming into play too often. Um, for standard games, you probably really want to have that sideboard three-match, uh, three-round, three-game match format. But getting to, like, man, the UI is good, man. Man, is it important to have a good design aesthetic on yeah. top of your game. I feel like we could go way deeper on this one. Uh, I think we have like one more major topic to touch on. But basically the, the, the root of this is Magic Arena is really good. If you happen to get an invite, I highly suggest checking it out. Because it's good. It's really good. Like, I'm impressed. We can't play each other, can we? Uh, no, I don't think they have... Uh, I don't think they have a friends list slash, you know, 1v1 duels that are not just random yet. But that's probably coming soon. I just, I want to see this completely supplant Magic Online completely. Oh, I think it will. I think it definitely will. They've already said they really don't want it to because they don't want to have to code in every single set. Like, the effort it takes to code a set in this client is a lot higher than the effort it takes to code up a set of, like, in Magic Online. Like, you've got a lot more animation budget and sound budget, and all, all of that has to go on before you uh, can bring a set into Magic Arena. So it's not like they can do the entire Wizards back catalog. That's just an undertaking that i don't think they are interested in so they've explicitly said that this is just going to be for standard draft and whatever like their advocated formats are not their advocated non-eternal formats are i'm guessing brawl is going to be available in this set seems really likely but brawl is probably designed explicitly for arena and I don't think Commander will ever be in here for that reason of... Yep. Like, if you want to play a Commander-style game in Arena, why don't you try Brawl? But also have to figure out how to get the UI to have more than two-player matches. That's true. I'm curious what they're going to do with, like, cards that rotate out, though. I don't know. The programming work on them is already done, so maybe they'll just have sort of new modern. New modern. I'm going to get forward. New Modern doesn't have Lightning Bolt. Everyone is okay with it. <laughs> Maybe the Mono Red folks. Although there's a new Lightning Bolt in uh, Dominaria. It just requires you to have a wizard. And there's also a new Counterspell that just requires you to have a wizard as well. Exactly. 
if you're playing a wizard's tribal deck, you can have both lightning bolt and counter spell. This was um I this is also like the first time I've gotten to play constructed magic in any form in like a while. And so this is the first time I've gotten to play with like an actually blue deck. Counterspelling things is fun. For everyone other than the person you're counterspelling. Yes. Maybe they shouldn't have played that expensive spell. So a topic that came up before uh we started recording the podcast is uh in games with a strict meta, which is loosely related to Magic the Gathering, um, there is a, a fine line between playing the game to the meta and just playing the game for the game's sake. And Tam, I think this was one of the topics that you were uh, starting, but you know, give a little backstory into, into more than what I just said. Yeah, I mean, so listening to... There's been a couple of things that have come out recently. One is the the most recent pack for uh, Legend of the Five Rings, or yeah, Legend of the Five Rings, and um, also this week was the big war a big Warhammer 40k rules update spanning the entire game, which has some not very subtle changes to the overall meta of that game, and. Uh, on top of that, there's a big in in a in War Machine, which I've also sort of vaguely keep up with. There was another big like shake up to the overall state of play, and also thinking about kind of the Dominaria, um, the Dominaria cycle happening. It's just been it's just a thing that that's been that I've been thinking about um, where you kind of get into a place. It's it's really it's really easy, especially in competitive games, but not exclusively where the game and the meta game are not in sync with one another the things that the game the game and the surrounding stories that are generated for it and by it don't match up with i hesitate to say how you're supposed to play but strategies and choices that drive you to increase your chances of victory which is broadly the meta game um and like i think it's really interesting i I think that i think that meta games are interesting but i also have i have watched uh i've watched them take over games like the wow meta game back before talents were removed entirely there were the right answers sometimes the right answer and then a whole bunch of wrong answers yeah and and you see this in a lot of games where it's like, hey, this thing seems cool, but you shouldn't do it because it's bad. Yeah. Here and that's are the... 50 choices. Only three of them are actually good. Yeah. Good luck, good luck figuring luck. out, you know, without going to the internet, which and ones they are. And part of that is part of that is design philosophy. Like part of that is just failure of design. But another part of that is also the way metagames evolve, where no, you're not going to play some particular character in some particular way or some particular strategy because the the things that the game emphasizes don't support you doing that if you want to succeed. And then if you're playing in a game, if you're playing in a team game or or some other cooperative multiplayer game, especially against other players like woe betide you if you are not playing to the meta because not only are you going to lose but everybody you're playing with is going to hate you for it yeah that's the piece that drives me crazy because it's so unfriendly to new players yeah like people don't have a good way of distinguishing between someone who's being an ass and intentionally building themselves in a subpar way to troll and someone who is legitimately new and has no idea that what they have chosen is the incorrect option. Yep. Yeah, or somebody who's like, hey, I like swords, and the character I'm playing has things that make them better at swords, and I've got this sword. Why can't? Why shouldn't I be doing these things? Yeah. Well, um, I, encountered, I encountered it a lot in uh, Destiny during mm-hmm. the first year where, based on failure of balance patches various weapons shifted in and out of the meta as usable because they were no longer effective against other weapons. 
Uh, so, like, the last time I played was a few weeks ago, and a patch has come in to make the pulse rifle better. And that means everyone is using pulse rifles, specifically the legendary pulse rifle that I'm drawing a blank on the name, but the one that has a five shot clip and looks like uh, Osiris themed. And like right. over the course of three Vigilance, Vigilance Wing, there you go. Over the course of three crucible matches, I died almost a hundred percent to Vigilance Wing. Like, every time I encountered somebody and they killed me, it was because they had a Vigilance Wing. And so that meta is now run Vigilance Wing or die. Or be very good at some other edge case weapon. But no, really the answer is Vigilance Wing. Just like when the game first launched, the answer was run Uriel's Gift, which was an auto rifle. And if you weren't running Uriel's Gift, you were doing it wrong because you were going to die. And that is really boring. And sucks really bad for anybody who has not gotten that the the particular weapon of the month to drop. And like I was okay with that meta because it fit into the kinds of weapons I like to play. I like playing auto rifle, but that meta was horrible for anybody who didn't like an auto rifle. Um, and and that's the problem that I run into as far as a playing the meta versus playing the game is there are certain things that I like. Weapon-wise, there are things I think feel good. And I personally will continue to use those regardless of how backwards it may be in the meta. So what that ends up causing is times in a game's patch cycle when I have a really fun time. Because I get to use the weapons that I want to use and feel effective doing so. And other times when it feels lousy. Because I'm continuing to use the weapons that I really like to use, but it is grossly ineffective. And I should stop doing that, but I don't want to because, you know, feelings. So, I feel like in a competitive environment, that's, like, especially when I'm looking at gun types, I I feel like there is mostly a... There's not enough differentiation going on between, like, those different gun types to say this gun, like, if you make a gun better than another type of gun, then that gun is just going to be better. It's hard to say that it's it's hard to, des- you, you need to design those somehow so that the pulse rifle is better against auto rifles and worse against, uh, I don't know, hand cannons. Well, and and a game that's done a really good job of that, I feel, is Overwatch. Because most characters in Overwatch are a hard counter for another character or characters. And, like, if someone is doing really well with a specific champion, the team can switch over to another champion to counter the the fact that they're doing really well with that champion. Um, League of Legends had a lot of that going on too, where like certain champions were just good counters for a specific kind of gameplay. Um, and that's, that's a level that, you know, Destiny, for example, just hasn't evolved to. Like they don't have a really good, you know, rock, paper, scissors type situation going on with their weapon design. Yeah. And, and I guess that's, and that's the kind of thing that, and, and Overwatch is a, Overwatch is a good example and like. It's the kind of thing that got me thinking about it to to start with as well, because like the the big 40k changes that just went in are being put in place beca- to balance these the shifting metagame that that that's been going on, where you know to sort of take the last couple of years of 40k development and condense them really uh, significantly. The uh, about two years ago, they had a problem where very tough things were dominating the 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 playing field because they were hard to harm and as soon as they were as soon as they were hard to harm they were the best things for basically everything because you could put your opponent in once you removed a few key pieces you could put your opponent in a situation where now they can't hurt your big thing and you can just raffle stomp them and so the meta shift with last year made that less effective so you can you you almost anything can hurt anything can hurt anything else which was not always true which led to a new meta 
in which the alpha strike is everything. Like first turn advantage is huge and dominant and uh, so on and so forth. And what was going on, what was evolving from that was a scenario in which, okay, the alpha strike is the alpha strike is everything. We don't want to be in a situation where ideally you don't want to be in a situation where you suddenly have second turn and have to weather somebody else's alpha strike. So what you'll do instead is put as much of your force as possible in reserves to drop in on the first turn so that even if you have the second turn, you still get your alpha strike. And this most recent change has taken that, has changed the rules for dropping in units pretty significantly to cut down on that play style. I am happy they are doing balancing like this with this edition because always the problem with 40k was whoever got the latest rules book was the dominant army. Yeah. Like every time a new rules book was released, it power creeped. And I and know people... Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, and by the end of a cycle, those last four books or whatever that were released at the end now dominated everything. Yeah. And yeah, and that's and that's a that's the thing that I'm I'm seeing more and more and it's sort of a thing that's been enabled by video game patch cycles. I mean, honestly, I feel like the biggest contribution to gaming that MMOs have brought is the idea of an evolving patch cycle where a game where games are no longer static and are constantly changing. And like that's just a natural part of play and it keeps it fresh. Because the idea of a game like Monster Hunter, going like sort of going back to the new event in Monster Hunter and just thinking about changing, being aware of the concept of a metagame and actively influencing it, whether that's by where whether that metagame is what is the core gameplay loop that people are doing. Um, like as an example of a as an example of a metagame that that uh we dealt with what one at one point when I was playing Borderlands, which is a purely co-op game, not purely, but all the parts that matter are co-op against the environment. I played a sniper in an environment where your other players are bringing uh, weapons with lots of particle effects. You can't effectively play a sniper because you literally cannot see your targets because they're obscured by fire or electricity or whatever. So even though my my preferred playstyle is effective in concept, it's not actually playable because I can never see my targets. And like there was nothing to break that meta. There 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 was no shift that that forced a change there. And so I eventually just had to do something else. And and I see that happen in other games as well, even non-competitive ones. But I like that that kind of intentionally intentional shifts to the metagame to keep things fresh for everybody and like it definitely makes people really mad when the way they know the game changes and they're like oh it's changing underneath me all the time but like i think that the game changing underneath you all the time is a good thing well i mean a game can't evolve unless it's constantly balancing yeah and it may just simply be that like those of us who are regularly playing mmos are just so used to that cycle of events that it's just normal. And maybe for other people, it's not quite to that point yet. Yeah. And I, and I totally understand the frustration that people have when it's like, I've invested this amount of time and effort and energy and sometimes money on this particular play style or this particular thing only to have it change out from under me and either be less effective or require more changes and thus more investment or whatever but i also feel like there's games with there's games where the meta is such that you just can't catch up the way grace was mentioning where it's just like if you're a new player this is super unfriendly and i feel like you need systems like final fantasy 14 often has where they're really trying to help you catch up either by lowering the cost of currency of the catch-up gear or putting equivalent gear in dungeons and granted they haven't done a great job of that all the time but i mean what they've tried to do is kind of what i think games have to do is give people a reasonable way out of the path that they chose yeah that when the game shifts on them they can they can figure out a way 
and get there without the same amount of investment that it took them to get to the original course. Mm -hmm. It should be easy. It should be easy for you to adapt. It should be easy. For, I, I I sort of feel like the the ideal case is it's easy for you to adapt as the meta inevitably changes, but the meta inevitably changes always. I mean, I think FF14 does another thing, which is basically it removes a lot of the need for some of this type of meta completely in that up into a point, and so you're really doing super high-end stuff. You like your gear doesn't matter so much other than like having the highest number on it that you can. Um, you know, if you're just running dungeons and and doing roulettes and things, like you don't have to think about it that much. And so for a new player, you I mean, there's catch-up mechanics to catch up for the gear level, but in terms of the meta and the stats that you know your priorities, you don't have to start diving into that until you're ready. Whereas, especially with a lot of competitive games, you have to kind of start thinking about the meta much, much earlier and what other people are going to be doing and how you're going to counter it. Yeah, and that's honestly like the reason why if I'm going to play a MOBA, I'm more likely to play Heroes of the Storm is I found the item build system from League of Legends just too many choices too early that I didn't know what I wanted to do, so I just kept buying, like, big dumb items that I knew weren't optimal, but they were increases of stat that's good. Whereas, like, in, in Here's the Storm, it just kind of gives you a bunch of this or that choices, which makes it more palatable to someone who doesn't actually know what they're doing. Like, and the depth is still there when you're ready for it, but until you're ready you still have something that you feel is functional. I mean, I've said this before, but if I have to do a lot of research to be able to even start playing your game, I'm probably just not going to play your game. Yes. But if I can start playing the game and be competent just learning the game by playing, then maybe I'll get into the game enough that I want to start doing some research to see how to improve myself. Yeah. But if I start playing the game and discover that I started wrong, I'm probably just going to quit. I'm not going to do the research and then start over. Yeah. Like, I don't even know if I like your game yet. I'm not going to spend hours on the internet figuring out how, how to play it correctly. No, thank you. Yeah, this is the reason why, like, Path of Exile is pretty unappealing. <laughs> well, Path of Exile is really boring for a really long time. It's also that. I mean, it's Diablo 2. It might take you a while before you get your actual ability that your build is based on. I mean, I think the ideal situation is if you have a game that's going to eventually have complex choices, start them off as really simple choices. Like, ease into the depth. Like, don't, don't just deluge your players with, like, a bajillion choices out of the gate, um, because that's, that's really confusing. And this is why playtesting is so important. Like, you need to know, both as a, as a designer, you need to know your game well enough to know what the meta is going to be. Or at least have a pretty good idea of the shape of it. And then you need to look at the choices that playtesters play are making when they're making them blind and seeing if they are matching the intended outcome. Because if, if the intuitive choices are the anti-meta choices, you are doing it wrong. And there's a lot of games that do this wrong, mm -hmm. where like, oh, hey, this looks like a viable strategy approach, whatever, but isn't. Um, notably, uh, a game we've been playing a decent amount recently, Terraforming Mars, is very good at this. It is of a game, it is of a board game type that is usually incredibly bad at this, <laughs> but it's a it's a great example of. Hey, actually, playing the game, <laughs> playing the game to the stated goal of the game is an effective way to play well. That is, if you focus on actually terraforming Mars and that's your primary focus, yes, you'll probably do pretty well. Yeah, you may not win, but you will at least make a pretty good run of it, and you will have a pretty good shot of actually winning. You also might win. Versus, versus, I've played other games of that type, and one of the reasons that I'm generally 
reticent to play games of that type where so this is how the game ends but you actually don't want to make that happen until it's the precise right time you don't want to actually progress forward until it is strategically the exact best time to do that and you really only know that if you understand the game's meta it's very yeah. sim it's very similar to oh you didn't know that the subtlety tree is garbage for rogues like you should have known that you just needed to know that yeah you rolled a or, paladin because you thought you were going to be able to you know fight monsters and tank no you get to wear a dress and bless people every five minutes i mean no that. i feel like i have words about the fact that hunter was given a bunch of melee abilities yeah and access to every melee weapon except gloves <laughs> and every single one of them was the wrong choice yep or the fact that shaman was giving a given a tanking tree <laughs> and some of that is we didn't understand like some of that is just as a designer you don't always get to understand how your game is going to get played and something that you think is going to be viable isn't but no. but then then that that needs to be the focus of your patches like whoops we made a thing that sucks let's fix it and also the cost for the player to fix it needs to be minimal mm -hmm. yeah not like oh we switched we made a big revamp to this talent tree once every year so we can so you can respect for free but like oh we changed this talent everyone can respect for free we made a we made a talent change or we made a change to an unrelated thing that changes a bunch of talent builds like oh we changed the way dagger damage is calculated like classes you can use daggers can respect honestly more than that i think it ought to more frequently be like the ability to respect is super cheap and or free just in general. Yeah. Like if you're in a situation where there's a potential for a wrong build or a wrong spec, then fixing that on the player's part needs to be very, very seamless. Yes. I mean, and then, honestly, the way I would, the, the change that I would make would be, re, you know, changing details about your character, your spec, or, you know, the your cards in hand, or, or whatever the equivalent of your, like, not immediate but relatively short-term effects are make that easy to change and if you make a big meta change to the game hey uh we made big changes to the the priest class if you play a priest we have given you a token that you can redeem for your level's worth of experience in a different class if you'd like to do that you can switch classes right now you've got the investment already somebody's already leveled that class maybe they want to level in all that's fine but if they don't if they don't want to level an alt and they don't like the class they're playing anymore, they're boned and they're just going to quit. Why not keep them around? Why not make that easy? But for me, it's really about like making sure that the meta actually matches the intuitive choices that you'd want to make. I would agree almost entirely with that statement, but I also would want to make sure that a game isn't like purposefully trying to slap down contrarian play. Like, if yes. you just want to go down in a different way, like, like you want to be different and you want to do a silly thing, I feel like you should be able to do it. You may not be optimal, but you should be able to do it. Like, like if for whatever reason you want to play this way, then fine, go for it. You know, we'll pat you on the back as you run off into battle. You may not be the best, but you'll be the happiest because you got to play whatever weird thing makes you happy. Yeah, and I think that's the I think that that's the thing that I think that's the mistake WoW made when it eliminated talent trees is they also eliminated the weird things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I also like when a game says, "Hey, you're about to the you just made a you you are looking at a selection that like that's a little weird and probably is going to make your game harder. Are you sure you want to do that? If so, you know, go for it. We're not going to stop you, but think about it maybe." Because I don't mind if the game warns me that I'm about to go down a real questionable path. It's the equivalent of your DM saying, are you sure? Sometimes I am sure. <laughs> like, and sure. Sometimes the, the number of times you want to go against a DM when they ask, are you sure? <laughs> it's pretty kind of minimal. Zero. <laughs> it's not zero. It's pretty I don't think zero. it's zero. <laughs> I mean. But at least then you know what you're getting into. Yes. Right? Okay, since we're trying to do the time boxy thing, um, I suppose we should wrap this up. Any parting thoughts on the uh, meta versus game discussion? 
or anything else we've talked about tonight? So I kind of want to. I've been I've been sitting here trying to formulate thoughts because this is this is one of those things I care a lot about. I have fun playing games that have a very strong meta, um, and I would be sad to see them just go away. So I don't know. I don't think it's about. I don't think it's necessarily about whether a game has a strong meta or not. It's about whether that meta is shutting other players out. Yeah. When that meta is a barrier to entry. I feel like the the phrase "get good" is often used in these scenarios, and it's maybe not a good phrase to use. Sure. Most of the time, when someone is so far off meta, it's because the game misinformed them of what path they should take. Yeah, it's not fun playing a game. It's not. It's not fun playing a game and losing always. And it's all. And it's equally not fun looking at a game and knowing that you're just gonna lose it until you understand it. Mm-hmm. The the thing I'm th- I always think of is like magic, because this is the game I play the most, and boy, I enjoy it. Uh, yeah. Notably, I actually think magic is really, really good about keeping a constantly shifting meta in such a way that it remains playable and interesting. Like it keeps it keeps a shifting meta, but it's still pretty. Like it's it. It's it's also important to note that like the meta goat will only get you so far, especially yeah, in a lot of these games. Like I don't necessarily love the mechanics of magic, but I think that they do a very good job of keeping the game as accessible as it can be while making sure that the meta is always changing for all of its players. I feel like they're doing a better job of that now, especially with the advent of challenger decks. Yeah. And if they can continue to to keep releasing decks of those caliber every so often, then it will do a great job of allowing players to hop in and experience the game by giving them a decent foundation. The, The biggest problem with magic is one of jargon at this point. Yeah. Because everything is is referred to as some term that only makes sense if you understand what that term means. Yeah, it's pretty bad. And this is as someone who used to play Magic, but that was years ago. And so half the jargon makes no sense to me now. But that's a whole other side of the meta discussion, the, the jargon discussion that we may want to table for another day. I think we've had it in one form or another before, but anyway... So we should probably wrap things up here. Um, Hopefully you enjoyed the show and we will be back next week for the uh, night in the woods show. So hopefully you're playing along with us. Buckle in. (laughs) Yeah. Buckle in for this. Oh boy. Uh, There's at least, at least uh, for me, like there's going to be like a lot of emotional unpacking. That's not entirely related to the show or to the game. Yeah. Get your tissues and popcorn ready. Yep. Uh, Oh, anyway, uh hopefully you enjoy the show and we will see you again next week. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. See you.